This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So Ariel Suskin is a fourth-year PhD candidate studying Greek and Roman art and archaeology at Case Western Reserve University and an alumna of the 68th class of the American Numismatic Society um, and also of the Summer Institute for Technical Studies in Art at the Harvard Art Museum. She holds an MA from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU and a BA cum laude from Tulane University. Her research focuses on how ancient artisan shaped public, private, and community identities through material culture with special interest in image replication, distribution, and coinage. She's the research lead for, as we know, as we can see today, uh, for the Calvin Smith Library special collections, uh, special collections, uh, Roman coin collections, and has also worked as a curatorial intern in the Department of Greek and Roman Art at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Ariel has presented at national and international conferences and has participated in the American excavation uh, at Sam Trace on site and remotely for the past three years. So please join me in welcoming Ariel. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, really. Thank you so much for having me. So let's get started. Today, I'm really excited to share with you the project that I've been working on um, here at Case Western Reserve University. So let's see, is my screen sharing? Yes. Can you already see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, awesome. So let's see. Sorry, I'm working with multiple windows and cameras, so we may have a little bit of technical back and forth, but everything should be working fine. So, hello everyone and good afternoon. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Lucia, and for having me back so soon after my last presentation. On a completely different track from uh, last time, today I'm here to introduce a fascinating coin collection that is both new, as it has never been widely accessible, and old in that the latest documented acquisition for the collection is from the 1940s. This presentation is really special to me in that it is so much of my work from this project would not have been possible without the fantastic lectures from this past summer's Eric P. Newman graduate seminar in numismatics. So here at Case Western University, the special collections department at Kelvin Smith Library uh, has been storing a collection of 325 ancient and historic coins. Uh, in the past year, I've worked with the Special Collections and Kelvin Smith Library Preservation Services to undertake a major project in preparing these coins for their public debut. The project consists of two parts. First, identifying and cataloging the coins to be published online, and second, to reconstruct the history of the collection and possible find spot information through archival research. In this talk, I'll go through a brief history of the collection, including what we know about the formation of the collection and its history, discuss the state of the materials as I join the project, and our current research and digitization efforts. At the end of the talk, I'll bring out a few highlighted coins from the collection to show you all today. Okay, let's see. My slide has not changed. Okay, there we go. So Case Western Reserve University from the founding of its core institution has been around for almost 200 years. We are now located in Cleveland, Ohio, but the school was originally founded as Western Reserve College in nearby Hudson, Ohio in 1826. In 1882, the campus, campus was refounded in Cleveland as Western Reserve University. Around the same time, the Case School of Applied Science, a polytechnic school in the city, became Western Reserve University's new neighbor. The Case School of Applied Science was renamed the Case Institute of Technology in 1947, and we still have some of the older signage around the campus. In 1967, the two schools officially federated and expanded to become Case Western Reserve University. You may ask what this has to do with the coin collection, but it is in fact this early history that is the most important as it is when the coin collection began. 
The collection then moved around both physically and interdepartmentally for the next century and a half. The earliest documented coin donation that we have is an Antoninianus, a debased silver of Gordian III, minted between 241 and 243 CE, from the T.H. Jones Esquire collection, gifted in 1854. Between then and around 1900, the collection grew exponentially thanks to a series of large gifts. The core donors were the three men that you see on the screen, Reverend Andrew Tully Platt, Reverend Oliver Crane, and Reverend Tillman Conklin Trowbridge. If you've done any work on the Yale Art Gallery's numismatic collection, these names may be familiar to you, as they were also major contributors to the Yale collection when it was held at the Yale Library. And this is how I found them. Uh, in the 1880 Catalog of the Greek and Roman Coins of the Numismatic Collection of Yale College by Jonathan Edwards. All three men were graduates of Yale, and it makes sense they want to give back to their alma mater. As for how they got to CWRU, Western Reserve College and the Cleveland slash Eastern Ohio were in some ways an extension of Yale in the 1800s, with the Western Reserve region also known as New Connecticut or the Connecticut Western Reserve. Cleveland itself is named for the first Connecticut surveyor, Moses Cleveland, a Yale graduate, class of 1777. Graduates of Yale would travel west to teach at Western Reserve College, the foundational institution of Case Western Reserve University mentioned previously, while Western Reserve College students were expected to further their education at Yale. As to how these Yale grads acquired the coins, all three of our main donors were missionaries in Turkey in the late 19th century, members of the American Board of Commissions for Foreign Missions. Say that three times fast. Pratt was a missionary doctor and a leading figure in the Turkish mission from 1852 until his death in 1872. Oliver Crane was more of a literary scholar and was only in Turkey from 1848 to 1852 when he returned to preach in the U.S., but he's also well known for his 1888 hexametrical line-by-line -line English translation of Virgil's Aeneid. Tillman Conklin Trowbridge, the youngest of the three, worked mainly in Constantinople or Istanbul for his service from 1856 to 1876, but was stationed briefly with Pratt. The archives of the ABCFM are held at Harvard, Yale, and the American Research Institute in Turkey slash Salt Archives. However, since the papers are held at so many institutions, it's been difficult to get a complete picture of the lives of Pratt, Crane, and Trowbridge. Most of what we have are records of their sermons and other religious activities. What I can say is that all three men were part of the Western slash Central Turkey mission, the core area highlighted in the diamond on the map, which was stationed primarily at Eintab, modern Gaziantep, which is here with the blue arrow. Agents of the American board did per periodically return to the states, and the years of the coin donations at Case uh, coincided with the known periods of leaves, leave for Pratt, Crane, and Trowbridge, with some posthumous gifts as well. In addition to generally spreading the Christian gospel, the Turkish missions were also in the region to support the Christian Armenian population, and a considerable amount of the archive correspondence is written in Armenian to local community leaders. A possible future project will be to transcribe and translate these letters to see if any of them contain references to our ancient coins. Most importantly for our uh, studies, however, the Central Turkey mission is the region that includes Antioch, modern Antioch in Turkey, which you can see here with the red arrow. Early on in my research, I was wondering why nearly every coin in the collection seemed to be either minted for or minted at Antioch. And once I got to our original donors, it made much more sense and made it hopeful that we could find some provenance. For those of you who are less familiar with the Hellenistic and Roman East, I will run through a brief history of the city of Antioch on the Orontes, henceforth known simply as Antioch, and its numismatic production. Antioch was founded in around 300 BCE by Seleucus I Nicator as part of the burgeoning Seleucid Kingdom which at its largest extent covered most of modern Turkey into parts of modern Afghanistan. The city was strategically located near the Orontes River and linked to the port cities of Laodicea and Seleucia and the inland city of Apamea, 
forming what was called the Tetrapolis. Our collection has several coins from Laodicea and Seleucia in particular, showing the continued close relationship of these cities. Minting began in Antioch shortly after its foundation, with the new Seleucid coinage being modeled after the coinage of Alexander the Great. The KSL collection doesn't have any of these first coins. The earliest coin that we have is a bronze of Seleucus III, Chironus, from around 225 BCE. As the Seleucid kingdom began to falter in the late second and early first centuries, Antioch began to mint autonomous coinage, often bearing the ethnic marker Antiochion, or of the Antiochians. Through a series of regional conflicts in the mid first century BCE, Pompey the Great emerged victorious and Antioch then became a part of Rome. However, the Antiochians were able to retain their rights to produce autonomous civic coinage. Until the Roman Imperial period, the silvers remained uh, iconographically stable, with minor changes to the legends for dating and regional authorities, and the bronzes as well, though several rulers, such as Antony and Cleopatra, had bronzes minted during their rule countermarked for a more secure financial guarantee. Provincial bronzes began promptly under Augustus. They lack the ethnonym of Antioch and have varying iconographies, including imperial portraits. These coins were intended for use throughout the Roman province of Syria, for which Antioch was made the capital. The most common bronze types are imperial portrait obverses and SC within a wreath on the reverse, which were struck for nearly every emperor from Augustus through Ale Severus Alexander at Antioch. These and other provincials minted at the city were separate from the imperial wide coinages and often have legends in Greek rather than Latin, though it is not a universal qualifier. Once the Severans became, uh, came to power in the early 200 CE, Antioch began to be used in, in earnest for the production of imperial coins, mainly silver denarii and gold aurii. But most importantly for our purposes, the new debased silver radiates, commonly called Antoniniani. Antioch became one of the chief centers for production of these coins through the reorganization of the, uh, up until the reorganization of the Roman mints under Diocletian and the Tetrarchy in 285. Antioch began, then began, became devoted exclusively to imperial coinage, with the provincials and civics ceasing to be produced. The Antioch mint remained in use well into the Byzantine period, though the KSL collection does not have any coins that late. Our latest dated coin is from around the split of the Roman Empire between East and West, from around 395 CE. We are pretty lucky with the collection, having such a rich variety of coins from one single place. We have several examples for each category, starting with our bronze of Seleucus III, all the way through the close just before the Roman imperial split with some bronzes of Arcadius and Theodosius near the end of the fifth century CE. That's over 500 years of production that is represented in this collection. For my research, I relied heavily on Richard Magali's Coins of Roman Antioch, particularly for information on the civic issues, and Christina Nauman's Antioch in Syria, a history, of, a history from Coins, in addition to the ANS databases, the RPC database, and the digital SNG for the coins that were minted outside of Antioch. One of my favorite things about the coinage of Antioch as an art historian is how a lot of the civic and provincial coinage uh, depict the uh, TK of Antioch, a famous statue by the artist Eutychides. The original bronze statue depicted the goddess TK, goddess of fortune, seated on a rock with her feet uh, on a personification of the Orontes River. The goddess wears a mural crown, a crown shaped like the city walls, to highlight that she is not a universal TK, but the TK of a specific city and she holds an ear of grain to symbolize prosperity. We know of the statue both through literary sources and through copies such as the one on the screen now in the Vatican museums. The Seleucids didn't use TK, this TK iconography very much, even though the goddess, not the statue, was apparently present at the founding of the city, according to legend. However, the civic issues and provincial coinage under the Romans, periodically, though not consistently, used the TK of Antioch as an emblem for the city. What's particularly fascinating to me is that there's no one specific view 
of the TK statue that is regularly used. As you can see from the example on the slide, Augustus had coins minted with the TK uh, statue facing right. Hadrian has several issues with the statue facing left. And one of the last civic coins minted at Antioch, which we have in the collection, has the statue facing directly out to the viewer. There are a lot of coins, not only from Antioch, that have a head or a bust of TK on the reverse, but the use of the whole figure representing the specific famous statue and engaging over time with the statue's existence as a three-dimensional object is really fascinating. These coins really show how the, uh, the staying power of one artist's work and the role of replication in keeping it alive in the visual culture of Antioch, since the statue, statue's iconography recurs over several centuries. The surviving documentation from the original donations is super interesting, but not well coordinated. On the left, you can see the original boxes the coins were stored in, mostly reused lantern slide boxes, and very generic labels filled with handwritten notes and envelopes. The coins were unfortunately not stored in the envelopes by 1973, and at least by the 1940s, information about the original donations was already becoming corrupted. One of the typewritten labels states that the coins were donated by A. G. Pratt, for example, and that led an undergraduate student researching the collection on a wild goose chase due to the discrepancy with his actual initials, A. T. Some of the envelopes in the boxes have detailed information and references, like the set on the left, which includes description of, descriptions of the coin's obverse and reverse designs inside an envelope with OC 1874, indicating that it was a coin gifted by Oliver Crane. Others are more general, like that on the right, which just says, Copper Coin, Republic of Venice. As I've been going through and identifying the coins, I've been working with the envelopes and the other early paperwork for the collection to try and match as many coins as I can to their original donors and donation dates, creating little packets such as those on the screen. Beyond the documentation that came in the boxes with the coins, I've been working with Special Collections and the University Archives to find any other information on the collection. Occasional envelopes make references to publications or receipts, but we've been unsuccessful in locating anything so far. However, occasionally we get lucky, such as this brief article in the Western Reserve University newspaper, The Reserve Weekly, from 1906. It mentions a gift of rare old coins from an 1871 alum, W.E. Curtis, who acquired a handful of coins from Jerusalem. Here I can say that we do have the coin of Pontius Pilate mentioned in the article, and you can see an image of our coin on the screen. Based on the limited information that we have, the 1906 donation seems to have been the last formal gift to the collection. Between then and sometime in the 1950s, most likely, the coins appear to have been used as teaching tools and were on exhibit in the original Western Reserve University Library, Hatch Library, sometime in the 1920s. The Reserve Weekly article above discusses an exhibition that was put on composed of coins both ancient and modern, some loans, some from the college collection. We have some handwritten notes from one C.H. Benedict in 1938 who attempted to make some kind of catalog for the coins, which he helpfully signed and dated, but did not include information about specific inventory. According to the article here and a few other newspaper references, in addition to note, some notes in the coin boxes, Jared S. Moore, a profession, professor of philosophy who arrived in 1907 and taught at the college until his retirement in 1950, donated and also loaned several coins to the collection. It is not clear how Dr. Moore acquired his coins, but he did seem to be quite the collector, not only collection, collecting ancient coins, but historic American coins as well. On one of the same box notes, Professor Kenneth Scott, a professor of classics from 1929 until 1943, also loaned several coins to the library. He traveled frequently to Italy and according to archival records, was in close contact with Benito Mussolini's inner circle. Scott resigned, but seems to have been urged to do so rather than voluntarily due to his Nazi connections. 
We have a handful of envelopes which specify Scots loans, mostly Macedonian and Ptolemaic coins, but no coins that match the envelopes in the collection. In addition, we have no envelopes noting either Moore's gifts or his loans. The latest dated information that we have is a series of library sign-out sheets indicating that a faculty member borrowed some of the coins from the library in 1852 and 1854. Hatch Library, which housed the coins during the early 20th century, was torn down in 1956. When College of the Western Reserve merged with Case, the Case Institute of Technology, the Special Collections Department was born. In 1973, the schools gathered all of their non-circulating materials from both institutions, including the coin collection, and put them under this new Special Collections umbrella. Special Collections houses CWRU's rare books, including many uh, medieval manuscripts, early printed books, photography, and other media. Any cataloging information that was associated with the coin collection is thought to have been uh, separated at this time, but earlier documentation, as we saw previously, indicates a disconnect from the provenance information had likely been happening steadily over the previous decades. The Special Collections Department has been undergoing an extensive cataloging project for creating records for those objects that don't yet have them. In addition to the coins, Special Collections also has other antiquities, including one amphora and several papyri fragments given to Western Reserve University in the 1940s by the Egypt Exploration Fund, now the Egypt Exploration Society. A pair of ID cards among the coin boxes state that some of the coins were gifted by the EES as well. However, while I can find the records of the papyri gift in both the CWRU archives and the EES archives, I have not been able to confirm the coin gifts in either archive. The papyri are all digitized and translated on the Case Special Collections website. The amphora is actually what initiated the coin collection project, as a previous Special Collections team member became interested in what other antiquities the university had in the collection. We can now say that for certain that the KSL Special Collections Roman Coin Collection has properly earned its name in that it is mainly composed of Roman coins. In terms of ancient coins, at least, it is a good complement to the Cleveland Museum of Arts collection, which has primarily ancient Greek coins. Most of what we have is in bronze, though we do have a large quantity of third century Antoniniani, the debased silvers. If you study coins of the Emperor Probus, we have them in the double digits, and we have quite a handful of coins of Carus with portraits of Numerian. I'm approximating as there are still a handful of coins that have not been identified due to extensive accretions, including a few Antoniniani based on their size and weight. However, the bulk of the collection, with a major exception, consists of types that we only have one or two examples of, covering almost the full imperial sequence from Augustus to Arcadius and Theodosius. We are missing some emperors such as coins of Claudius, Caligula, or Nerva. But for those that uh, study the Feltemp Reparatio bronze reform to the Constantinian dynasty, particularly the fallen horseman types, we have a substantial no number of those. As I mentioned earlier, we also have many Antiochia, both Roman provincial and the civic issues. We have a few provincials mainly from other cities in Asia Minor, such as a pair of Trajanic, Trajanic bronzes from Laodicea Ad Mare, with Laodicea Ad Mare countermarks, and a few other coins from the original Tetropolis. When the collection was originally brought to the preservation services, the priority was to examine the coins and accession them. They all now have accession numbers based on what box they were found in, and have been rehoused in archival quality binders with individual envelopes. From there, previous library staff and a classics undergraduate started to study the coins, but once they left the university, the project languished, and the COVID-19 pandemic made in-person uh, in work with the coins very difficult. The biggest issue is that no one outside of special collections knew the coin and coins existed until very recently, because they weren't cataloged, no one could look for them, and because no one looked for them, there was no impetus to get them cataloged. However, that all changed last year when a pair of undergraduates took, undertook their senior project, 
creating a new documentation apparatus for the collection as part of their work with preservation services. I was pulled into the project in February to help create a formal catalog of the coins. I've been going through and identifying them, creating spreadsheets with all their information, and working with the digital collections team to create metadata protocols for the upcoming online catalog. Many of the coins were in need of cleaning when I was working on identifying them, and a few likely need treatment for bronze disease. The Conservation Department at the Cleveland Museum of Art was kind enough to come and evaluate the collection and advise us on best practices. Some of the accretions on the coins may be adhesive remains from display in the early 20th century, but some of it seems to have been burial dirt that has long since calcified. I've been cleaning as needed with ethanol and deionized water mixtures to clarify iconography and inscriptions. We will be bringing several of these coins for exlifluorescence testing to determine the material makeup and scanning electron microscopy for a particularly interesting coin that seems to have textile remains attached, and then treat the coins for those with confirmed bronze disease. The goal is to get any coin stabilized that need it and prevent further deterioration. A lot of our coins are worn or very small, so we used a digital microscope to take magnified pictures of inscriptions, designs, and mint marks, hard to see with the naked eye or regular photography, so we can identify and catalog them. The microscope helped capture details like the edges of the wings on the doves of the obverse and reverse of this Sicyonian obol. The coin itself is barely a centimeter in diameter. A major component of our cataloging efforts has been pho photographing all the coins. Here we have Andrew Mancuso, team leader, preservation services, and Madeline Newquist, a fellow PhD student in the art history department, checking our camera settings and coin photography setup. Special thanks to Alan at the ANS uh, for his lecture on coin photography during the summer seminar, as we've been following his model very closely and our photos are coming out really great. Right now, the digitization of the coins and getting them up on the Case Western Reserve University digital resources platform is the priority for the team. We are a little over halfway through with the photography. The KSL database, including special collections, is moving to a new platform in 2025, along with many university libraries in the whole state of Ohio. The Roman coin collection will be published online as part of that new database launch. In addition to traditional photography, we are working on an RTI documentation of the collection. RTI stands for Reflectance Transformation Imaging, where a series of photographs of an object are taken with lighting from various directions in order to highlight the dimensional aspects of the object. For coins with relief decoration, it is an extremely helpful form of documentation, and for our collection, since so many of our coins are worn or have very dark patinas, it makes it much easier to view the details. Omar Largiri, a member of the uh, Case Western Reserve University Computer Science Department, worked with the Preservation Services to create, construct a special dome that automatically changes the lighting to set positions to take rapid RTI images of the coins. Haley Lada, a senior in the Classics Department, focused her senior writing project on the application of the new RTI apparatus and programming for numismatics, focusing on the KSL collection. All right, fingers crossed this video works. Um, let's see, is it going? Yes, great. Uh, so here I took a recording of the RTI viewer used on one of our coins, an Antoninianus of Claudius Gothicus from 268 to 272 CE. Here I go through only a couple of the visualization settings, uh, but as you can see, there are many more. Offering digital exploration elements, previously only visible through in-person manipulation of the coins. The intention is to include RTI viewers or portals on each coin page in the collection once it is online to allow users to adjust the lighting of the coins at will to highlight whatever parts of the coins each viewer is interested in. slides. So that's what I've got for the history of our collection and the future plans for you today. Uh, I'm now going to jump in and take a few minutes just to talk about a few of my favorite particular coins from the collection. 
So I'm going to stop sharing right now and I'm going to switch to my camera and hopefully this will work. Okay, so we're back and now we are back. Okay, so now, yes, okay, you should be seeing a coin instead of me. So here we have on the screen, uh, we briefly discussed the history of our earliest Hellenistic coins. So now let's take a closer look. Here is one of our bronze coins of Seleucus III Coronas. Let's get that back into focus um, from around 225 BCE. Seleucus was one of the Seleucid kings, as his name suggests, but he only ruled briefly from around 225 to 223 BC. It's a very small coin, um, and the obverse depicts a head of Artemis facing right uh, with the quiver just visible over her shoulder. So I'm going to point with my little pointer here. You can see right there. That's the edge of the quiver. Um, despite the small size, the coin is really, really detailed. Like you can see the twists in Artemis's hair. Uh, you can see the drapery around the shoulders. Um, so it's really, really nice. We've got some really good relief going on. And now on the reverse, We have Artemis's twin brother, Apollo, seated. Get that back into focus. Um, he's sitting on the omphalos, or the belly button of the world, and he's facing left, testing an arrow with one hand and holding a bow in the other, as archer gods are wont to do. You can just make out the inscription behind him. Um, you've got the letters for Basel, which is short for Basileus, um, or king, and in front, is Seleucus on this side, which you can barely make out, but it is actually visible under the microscope. That did not get centered. So let's give you guys a minute with that. All right. So next, we have, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit because this one's rather large. One of our coins with a countermark, which is really interesting. We have a, quite a handful of those. Um, so who doesn't love Cleopatra? Yes, the famous Cleopatra VII. Here we have one of the civic coins of Antioch with a countermark of Cleopatra. After the civil wars that resulted from the assassination of Julius Caesar, Mark Antony took over the Roman East, including Roman Syria, where Antioch was the capital. Soon after his marriage to Cleopatra VII, he began minted silver tetradrams with his and hers portraits on either face. Um, however, they did not appear to have minted new bronzes, instead choosing to countermark local issues such as this one, um, that is stamp the pre-existing coins with their overarching authority. So this particular bronze is among the sort of transitional coinage from Antioch in the Roman Republican period, where they were still minting civic coinage and provincial issues had not yet uh, begun to be minted. The obverse features a head of Zeus facing right. It's a little hard to tell because the coin is off center in the strike, but you can sort of see it in this lighting where you have, you know, his face is over here, but we can see the edge of the coin is a little bit not at the edge here um, with its beaded, um, beaded rim. Uh, so right in the center of this coin down here, this is the countermark. It's in an oval stamp, um, and inside there's a portrait of Cleopatra facing right. So there's her chin, and back there is the um, is her bun, and the portrait is pretty close to sort of how her portraits are rendered on her contemporaneous coinage. Um, there are some scholars that argue this might be an Apollo, but based on the dating of the coin, which is pretty close to sort of when Mark Antony gifted um, Syria to Cleopatra, it seems to sort of make sense that this would be um, a portrait of Cleopatra instead. So on the reverse, we have another sort of iconograph uh, iconography that is typical for this type which is a seated Zeus on the throne holding a scepter um, in one hand with a small Nike on the other. 
Unfortunately, our Nikkei has basically been worn away, um, but she would have been thereabouts. Um, let's see. On um, framing each side of Zeus is the legend um, of the Antiochians metropolis. You can kind of make out the triple down here on this side, um, but the rest of the words are better visible on, in once they're magnified. Okay, next we have sort of one of the more common types uh, minted at Antioch. So we have one of the provincials. Um, this is one of the typical provincial bronzes where we have an imperial portrait on the obverse and um, I'll show you the reverse in a minute. This particular coin was donated by A.T. Pratt in 1874 or more likely gifted posthumously by his wife. The portrait of Trajan is incredibly clear despite the legend being mostly worn away. This is another one of those coins that's kind of struck off center. Um, Trajan was emperor from uh, 98 to 117, and under his leadership, uh, the Roman Empire reached its greatest geographic extent. Uh, this coin will actually be a really good uh, candidate for our RTI examination, as you can see some of the hints of the letters, you know, along the side here that would probably really benefit from having sort of this multispectral imaging. Um, we can kind of make out uh, the... Uh, abbreviation for autoprator, the Greek equivalent of the Latin imperator. Um, but despite that, the portrait of Trajan is really well preserved. Now the reverse is this very typical uh, Antiochian provincial SC within a wreath. Um, the SC monogram is much debated um, on, on imperial coins. It is us usually in interpreted as Sinatus Consulto by decree of the Senate, um, but in the provinces it may re represent senatorial honors conferred or a mark of authority as the Senate, especially by this time, didn't really have much actual power um, to enact things. Um, despite its unclear meaning in the modern age, it is uh, the SC was clearly important in the Roman period, as it appears on provincial coinage of Antioch throughout the imperial period, though the monogram in the wreath type seems to cease production by the end of the Severans. Speaking of Severans, let's get him in focus. This is one of the more beautiful coins that we have uh, in the collection. It's, it's, the reflectiveness of the silver is not very being very nice to my camera. Um, but this is the last Severan Emperor, Severus Alexander, who is uh, on a denarius that was minted at Rome. This coin was also donated by Pratt or his wife in 1874. And the envelope specifies that it was taken into the collection on January 26th of 1874. Severus Alexander was the last emperor of the Severan dynasty, and he ruled from 222 to 220, uh, 235 CE. He ascended to the throne as a teenager and managed to keep hold of power for a very long time, considering his age, until his assassination in the military coup that ushered in the crisis of the third century. We have on the obverse, of course, a portrait head of Alexander Laureate. You can see the stippling on the dye that was used to render the emperor's military haircut. Let's see, can I get that into better focus? Yeah, we move it over here. You can really see sort of the contours of the head um, and the way that the hair is rendered back here with this really, really close uh, cropped haircut. And then on the reverse, this diaxis is upside down, but here we go. You can see the goddess Providence uh, holding corn ears and a cornucopia. So she's got the corn ears going down over here and the cornucopia up here. And then down here is a modius or a grain measure um, at uh, her feet. Despite the condition of the blank, uh, the impression is really, really nicely done and remains very clear. This coin is not a particularly rare type overall, but it is one of the few proper silvers that we have uh, in the collection. Most of what we have in terms of silver is 
as I mentioned before, the debased silvers, the Antoniniani. And this is one of the first coins that we had accessioned, um, an Antoninianus of Probus. Uh, the obverse depicts the Emperor Probus, who ruled for the short period of 276 to 282. Like most emperors during the crisis of the third century, he was killed in a military coup. Here he is depicted in a military cloak with the typical radiate crown used on Antoniniani. So you can see there that the little radiate spikes coming out of the crown. Um, and the radiate crown was used to differentiate the silver values. Um, and the Antoninianis have the radiates and is debased. So most of it is bronze, not silver. And we plan to do XRF testing on our Antoniniani to actually see how much silver um, is in each coin. On the reverse, we have one of the uh, common iconographies on Antoniniani of the third century, depicting the emperor standing left, um, receiving the globe from Jupiter, so the emperor's over here, and then we have god Jupiter over here holding a scepter, and he's handing the world to the emperor, so we have the little globe in there. Um, a lot of these, this particular sort of iconography also tends to have a little Nike uh, or victory that stands on the globe. Um, this particular uh, issue does not. Uh, the legend reads Clementia Temp or Times of Peace and Clemency, which was definitely something to strive for, but alas, did not occur for poor Probus. Uh, in the center, we have uh, a Tau and then a Kappa Alpha um, for the mint mark. Uh, so this was a combination that was used at the Mint of Tripolis, not at Antioch. Um, and this is actually one of our only Probus coins that is not from Antioch. And it's very sort of odd man out in that it was the first coin that we accessioned, but it is so far away from sort of the typical pattern of what we have. Okay. So the last coin that we have, that I have for you today, and I really hope this one comes into focus um, let's see, we're going to have to zoom in a little bit. There we go. I hope you can kind of see him. Um, he, uh, this is one of our Constantinian bronzes, uh, coin of Constantine the first with a portrait of his son, Constantine the second. Um, it's a small bust of Constantine the second laureate and wearing a military cuirass. Um, I love this coin because he has, uh, Constantine the second has a very, very round face, um, like this is his whole face. It's almost a circle here. Um, as he was incredibly young when, um, this coin was minted, Constantine the first declared Constantine the second as Caesar, um, when Constantine the second was just an infant. Um, the legend reads Constantinus, uh, Yun Nobsi or Constantine, the junior noble Caesar. Um, Constantine intended for his offspring and his nephews to co-rule the empire, uh, but apparently learned nothing from his own rise to power, and they would end up killing each other for imperial control. This militaristic outlook, and hopefully you can see this more clearly, is visible. Yeah, okay, let's get that into focus again. Okay, you can just make out one of the soldiers. Um, so this reverse uh, depicts two soldiers holding two standards um, and is a common type used across the coinage of many of the Constantinian rulers. Uh, the glory of the army, Gloria Exercitus legend emphasizes this military focus. Below the ground line, you can really can't see it, but it does have the mint mark uh, S-M-A-N, uh, Signatum Moneta Antioch, and the Officina mark S. Um, I'm now going to switch back because that is the last of the coins that I have to show you today. And hopefully this transitions properly. Okay, let's go. Oop, okay. So those are our coins that I just showed you. And here you can get a better view of Constantine II's very round face. Um, so that's just a fraction of the collection to give you an idea of the kinds of coins that we have. To raise awareness of the collection, both within the university and outside, um, 
uh, we have a preview page up on the library website and um, you can see the link on the screen. My camera is being very weird, sorry about that. Um, the URL at the bottom is a permalink. So when the new platform launches, it will still lead to the collection page. Um, in the meantime, we are working in to loop professors in the classics and art history departments to integrate the collection into future courses now that we have most of the collection cataloged. We hope in the long term to get the KSL Special Collections Roman Coin Collection integrated into the larger numismatic databases so that scholars and enthusiasts such as yourselves can easily find them. The collection will also be available for in-person study and teaching sometime in the near future. The collection will officially be online this coming June, so please check back with us to see all 325 of our fascinating coins in the Kelvin Smith Library Special Collections Roman Coin Collection. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, fantastic presentation. So I, uh, can I open the, I will open the floor now to discussion. Are there any questions for Ariel now? Yes, uh, please. Uh, fabulous project, uh, great presentation. Thank you. I'm wondering about, um, unless I missed it at the very beginning, uh, uh, funding sources. So student labor is great, um, and you're all doing a, a great job, but there must be some funding coming from somewhere. Is it general university funds? Is there a special grant? Is there a local numismatic enthusiast who's helping to support this? So uh, this project in particular is supported by the university. It's through the library um, program. So we don't have any external funding um, that's applied to um, uh, this project at the moment. Um, we may be seeking outside um, funding if there's additional sort of work that needs to be done. But for now, everything's funded, funded internally through the university. Cool. Other questions? I have a question. So when these, um, so when the donors originally uh, gave uh, these coins uh, uh, to the university, um, were they thinking about them being used, for example, for teaching as teaching tools? I can honestly say that I do not know. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of documentation for the particular sort of like moment of transaction when these coins were given. We just have these these dated envelopes. Um, it's entirely possible that they were intended to be used as teaching tools, but also sort of to build a university collection because um, it's sort of around that this this time, the late um, 18. Uh, hundreds where a lot of the universities are sort of starting to build both their art collections and their antiquities collections. So it could be a bit of both. Um, but I don't have any sort of information that tells us specifically sort of what the um, intentions behind the donations were. Thank you. So I have two questions here. One from uh, Lennox Burger who asks, can you talk uh, about the database uh, uh, being used to host the coin metadata and images. So what's your project? How are you building this uh, database? So um, I am working with the digitization specialists in the library. Um, I'm not really in sort of the computer and tech aspects of everything. Um, so I cannot specifically tell you um, any details about the new the new database um, where we should be getting sort of the test portal short uh, soon. And so we'll be doing mock-up pages of what the coin collection will be looking like. Um, so basically my role is to give the 
digital team, um, sort of all the information, um, sort of how we need to label uh, the different components, and then they'll put it into the, the system and then we'll sort of run checks through to make sure that everything looks okay. Um, but in terms of like the actual technical aspects, I cannot tell you anything specific, I'm sorry. Okay, and um, another question for you from Robert. Uh, are any of these coins not previous, previously published? So for example, what which were the criteria uh, these people were using in donating these coins? I mean, of course they were in Antioch, so they're from Antioch. Were they looking, for example, for variants or was market availability? Um, I honestly don't know. Um because we sort of seem the each of the donors seem to have been giving things independently. I don't know if they all sort of collaborated to pick a sort of set. Um, we do overall seem to have like a full imperial sequence almost, um, not entirely. So it may just sort of be have been an intention to get every Roman emperor represented um, in the original donation, but um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, in terms of types, uh, for the most part, these are all types that have been represented in other um, in other collections that are on sort of the re the traditional databases in the RIC in the RPC. Um, but these individual specimens have not been published previously, um, as far as we can tell. Um, so we do sort of want to bring these into the collections to help sort of support the the typologies and maybe someone who specializes, you know, in uh, Roman traditional coins can find sort of unpreviously un represented types among them because um, I am definitely not a specific expert in um, in these these coinage types. Thank you, and uh, of course, uh, Jesse, Jesse, whom you know very well, I can you know, says that of course, which is true that the live manipulation on the images is great. And uh, can it be used when the images are zoomed in? He asks. Um, I am not a hundred percent sure about the specifics of the RTI. Um, we can probably do a magnif like set the magnification higher and then do the RTI, but I don't think you can do the zoom and the RTI simultaneously. Um, I do know that um, the team that was working on building the dome is working on documenting sort of how to build a dome, how to get the software to work so that everything goes in sequence, and they are um, hoping to publish that soon. So um, that is uh, something that, yes, I believe the ANS can use it in the future once everything is published. Um, but again, I'm sort of working on the coin side of things, not on the tech side of things. Um, so. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Fantastic. So uh, are there other questions for Ariel? Um, I, I'll just speak up quickly. Uh, my name is Bill Claspie. I'm the head of special collections here at Kelvin Smith Library. Um, and I just want to express my gratitude to... Uh, to Ariel and, uh, of course, to all of my colleagues here in the library. Um, as she pointed out, uh, we're working on this um, just as part of our daily work routine. Um, obviously, this collection has been part of the university for a very long time. Um, and I, 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 in particular, like to think about um, all of the faculty and all of the students over the past uh, century and a half <laughs> who have in some way use this collection um, and capped off with uh, the fantastic work that that Ariel and the others are doing um, right now uh, on this collection. So I just wanted to uh, uh, to give thanks to, to Ariel for this great talk uh, and to acknowledge um, what it means to us here uh, at Case Western. Thank you. And uh, I can see that uh, Andrew drop uh, drop the email so that we can eventually reach out to them directly. So thank you for, for, for this incredible talk, really, for teaching us so much about, sincerely, uh, 
a coin collection we didn't know about. So this is really amazing. So thank you, Ariel. Thank you, all of you, really, at Case Western Reserve University. So thank you and Special Collection Libraries.